Hey, Alina. Hey, Ricardo. How are you? Good. Good. How are you? Good. I, I hope, hopefully they're going to show up today. We'll see. Let's see. I know 8 a.m. is the time that works like for everybody in EU, China, and US. But I, but I fear that sometimes it can be too early for people in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I think especially people in engineering and like they, some of them actually start working a little bit later, like maybe nine or 10, so. That too, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Hi there. How are we doing? Hi, Adrian. Hello. Put this full screen. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can. I can hear you. And maybe we can wait another couple of minutes and see if somebody else shows up, and we can get started. See if I can find the uh, minutes. Yeah, I just posted them on the Zoom chat. Oh, cool. So I think we can start. Uh, people are maybe going to show up a little bit later, but yeah. So so th thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, present uh, Trout. Uh, excited to to be here. So the presentation will be recorded, so it's, um, you know other people can actually watch it later. Uh, and yeah, and then happy to learn more about like uh, how you implemented it. Uh, container registry in Rust. Yeah, cool. That's good to hear. Um, do you want me to start now, or do you have any yeah. other business? Okay, yeah. cool. Um, I did prefer a, a few slides. I'll share those. Um, I am quite keen to have uh, you know a discussion as well, though. So, like, feel sure. free to stop me or whatever, and yeah. ask any questions. I'm really keen to get like feedback on the the ideas and so on. Yeah. Um, okay. How do I? I'm not. Uh, how do I share? Oh, there we go. The big share screen button. That would probably help. And there we go. And now I'm a bit worried you'll lose it when I click present. Can you see the, the slide? Yep. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I work for Container Solutions, and we have a, a product called Trow, which is an open source um, registry implementation. Um, yeah, as I was saying, I do want to kind of have a discussion about things. So I thought it might be interesting to sort of first talk about what's going on with like registries and so on in general. Um, uh, and also I kept this talk fairly technical given it was the, the SIG runtime, which I, I assume was the right decision. So you can, we can talk about standards and stuff. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few things that are going on in the registry world, which I think are quite interesting. And it's, you know, a space that's kind of needs some updating because not a lot has really been happening until the last year or so. Um, yeah, really 
you know, it's not changed much since the initial versions of Docker distribution, or at least since it moved to V2, which is a good few years now. Um, so what's happened recently? Well, Docker distribution, as I'm sure you know, was do donated to the CNCF. So uh, it'll be interesting to see where that goes next because it was, you know, it wasn't, sorry, my dog squirming about. Um, it was um, in a state where people were asking for updates and to be frank, Docker weren't doing much with it. Like there, there had been very little progress on it. So it'll be interesting to see what happens now. That's part of the CNCF. Um, a lot of registries, uh, and I'm particularly thinking of things like the, the Google was artifact registry and Azure have one. And so and you've all started moving towards supporting multiple artifacts. So registries are no longer just for um, container images. They're also for things like Helm charts, OPA config files, um, like CNAB bundles, things like that. Uh, I guess cloud native stuff. Um, there's probably an argument that we've really recreated FTP servers, but that's maybe being a bit cynical and added a, a REST front end on the top. Um, there is, as I'm sure you're also aware, a, a standardization process at the OCI. So you've got the, um, oh, I don't remember what it's called now, but the, effectively distribution spec. Um, I'm struggling to remember the official title, but um, there is a, a spec and it's also a conformance suite. So you can like verify whether or not uh, a particular implementation conforms to the standard. Um, and they're starting to talk about, you know, doing extensions. Uh, and in particular, one of the most important things that's being talked about is Notary V2. Uh, so you're probably aware of Notary V1, which uh, was, you know, how we did signing or like, not how we did signing, but was an implementation or signing for container images. So people could sign an image and, to, to, so, and then people who had the image could verify that it came from who it claimed to come from effectively. Uh, and also it was quite a, you know impressive implementation because it had all the, the update framework stuff in it. So it could also verify that it was up to date uh, and things like that. that. Now, there were a lot of problems the first or there are problems to the first version of Notary, um, it's not seeing as much uptake uh, as we would like. And there's issues like you, we can't, um, you know, signatures don't travel with images. So one thing we'd really like to see is if an image is moved from one registry to another, you can still somehow, you know, move the, the sign with it and, and still, uh, you know, tell where it came from. Uh, and that's the sort of stuff that's been worked on in Notary v2. Um, and I know both Docker and Justin Cormack and uh, Microsoft and Steve Lasker and people are, are working heavily on this. The interesting thing is they've kind of, Notary v2 is very different from Notary v1. It's not, you know, they've kind of moved away from the first version of Notary, which I thought was a, an interesting decision, but, uh, you know, maybe makes sense with given the problems they're trying to solve. Um, and the reason I bring this up in this context is because it's going to be very important for registries, like how we handle signing is a, is, uh, is going to affect how things going forward. Uh, and that leads me on to the other point that I think is going to become very important over the next few years, and that's supply chain security. And some people have started looking at this. You've probably seen projects like Intoto and Grafeus, and, and I think the Google Cloud Platform has even integrated some of those solutions. Um, I've not really played with what exactly they've done yet, but I think this is going to be quite a big thing. And um, yeah, you'll see more sort of solutions uh, and, and people talking about this, uh, particularly in the light of things like the, what was it, Cloud? I forget the company recently that had an enormous breach that affected Microsoft and everybody. SolarWinds? Some, some. Solar SolarWinds, yes. No, I'm sure why I'm saying Cloud. Some. You're right, SolarWinds. Yeah, and you know a lot of that was all about supply chain security and being knowing where stuff came from and being able to prove where it came from, basically. Um, Okay, so the other question you can ask yourself is why, what's the point in Bolton and the registry given we have Docker distribution and so on? Um, well, the first thing I'd argue that there's not actually that many open source registries. Um, the two big ones are Docker distribution and Key or Quay or however you're going to pronounce it. That um, you know was CoreOS and is now Red Hat and I believe they open sourced it. Um, I don't know how many people are running the, the open source version of, um, <laughs> I struggle to say Quay, but I guess that's the official pronunciation because as you're probably aware in, in 
the UK and Europe, it's normally pronounced key. Um, and that one's written in Python. Uh, Docker distribution uh, is obviously very popular, um, particularly because it's used in Harbor. So if you're using Harbor, uh, you're really using Docker distribution plus a few other things. Um, yeah, we, we had a, just a comment. So we had Quay also present uh, a few months ago. And Harbor is also another CNCF project, right? So, mm. Yeah. Just a, yeah, yeah, I'm not not yeah. I think they're I'm not knocking any of them. Um they're all fantastic. I'm particularly interested in, in I, I I want to like dig into to key a bit more or quay and and figure out how it did some of the does some of this stuff because they did some interesting stuff with like uh distributed downloads and things. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and Harbor has added on a whole bunch of stuff that's very important. Um like vulnerability scanning. Uh, and a nice GUI and things like that, and things that are sort of essential for enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is with Trio is I've kind of focused on slightly different things. Um, and the way I started describing it, and I'm still kind of working on how I describe it and how I think about it. So I'm, I'm very interested in the feedback. Um, but I sort of started talking about the working set. So most registries at the minute, um, they're designed to store all your images for all time, if you like. So you push all your test images. Um, you know, you have old versions of the images dating back to v0.1 of the software. Uh, and they all live in your clusters. So you can go back and get them and check whatever's going on. But with Trout, I started thinking about things a bit differently. And what I want to focus on was like the working set of images. So I'm being able to sort of securely and efficiently deliver those to the, the nodes within a cluster. And so by work and set, what I mean is just the bare set of images that are required to run your applications or your system. So it's not the full history. It's not like all the things going back in time. It's just what do you need to get your application up and running? Um, you know, maybe like a version back for rollback or whatever. But it's a much more constrained problem. Um, and leading on from that, uh, the design that I normally you know, you can use, it's just a registry. So you can do what you like with Trio. You know, you could store everything and there's absolutely no reason you can't. Um, but the way I sort of designed it is it's normally will run inside a cluster, so typically a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so if you have a system with multiple clusters, you'd have multiple instances of Trio. Uh, and those instances of Trio could then talk to, you know, uh, another registry which may be storing all your images, for example. So it's not that, so in a lot of cases, try might not replace Harbor or whatever it may be. It could work alongside it, for example. Um, I have there is no choice of storage backends in Trout at the minute. It just saves the file. That was a deliberate decision. I might revisit it at some point, but I definitely want to keep the the simplicity of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems in Docker distribution because they support S3 and things like that, and the sort of guarantees that S3 gives you are very different and create a lot of complications. And that's you know one of the reasons that deleting stuff is so hard in Docker distribution. Um, yeah, I also really want to think about security and auditing. So one thing I really want to uh, I'll think I'll talk about this a little bit later, hopefully, is when I'm thinking about auditing. You know, the, the registry if it runs inside the cluster, and then the registry should really give you a good overview of what's happening in the cluster. I should be able to look at it and see. Okay, what are the images that are currently used in the cluster and how they've changed over time and who made what changes and so on. So I think there's a lot of benefits to an approach like this for, for auditing and security. Um, finally, um, lightweight. So, you know, it needs to run in the cluster or I intend it to run in the cluster. Um, and so I don't want it to consume, you know, a lot of resources. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm thinking like CPU as much as anything else here. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that as I chose Rust as you pointed out earlier. Um, so what's some of the current features? So at the minute is OCI standard compliant. It does have the catalog API, which is the, the thing that lets you say, you know, list all the repositories and images within the, the, the cluster. Um, I also added what I call the tag history API. So I can say, you know, say you've got the image Redis 3.4. I can say, give, you know, if you ask for that tag, it will give you all the shards of all the images that have ever pointed to that tag, for example, which again can be interesting for, for history. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about is like how you can integrate better with clusters. 
So one of the first things I did was add sort of image controls. So the idea is, um, so the, what, I've, what I've got at the minute is an emission controller that, that you can spin up. The emission controller talks to Trow. Um, and so if you create a new deployment, uh, the image controller will check the images in that deployment. Um, uh, and by default, what it will say is, if this image does not exist within the registry, then disallow it. Um, you can also expand this with regex, so you can say things like, okay, if the image exists in this local registry, allow it, but also allow official images from the Docker Hub, but not user images and things like that. So I tried to make it easy to, to, to add controls like that. You can also do some um, very similar things with um, OPA. Um, so that's another way to go for that. Uh, proxy and Docker Hub, so that's a, a thing I, I implemented uh, the end of last year. Um, and that's another thing that I, I see as sort of an essential feature for really to, to try and take try forward is sort of being able to proxy and cache images. So, so this is, goes back to working in alongside other registries, if you like. Uh, but the proxy in the Docker Hub was, as you're probably aware, there was the Docker Hub added um, limits on how often you could download images. So with the proxy in the Docker Hub thing just allows you to have a local copy uh, and therefore control or reduce the, the number of times you need to go to the Docker Hub. And you, uh, question, so when you proxy Docker through to Docker Hub, do you um, keep track of uh, the limits or, or you don't yet? So like uh, um, somebody wants to keep on pulling images from different versions, does it have a mechanism to throttle back or it doesn't yet? No, there's nothing like that. Um, but having said that, you can associate a user. So, I mean, and that works both for, excuse me, for pulling private images and for um, the, the limits are per user. So like if you authenticate to the Docker Hub, you get like a, a higher amount of limits. So you can, you can use a certain user. But the limits like, uh, you know, it's, I can't remember what the, is it per hour? They're a bit odd. So it's actually, and also they don't enforce them strictly, but there is a way you can ask the Docker Hub, you know, what's left of my current quota and things. So I could actually do something like that. It's not something I really thought about, to be honest. Got it, got it. Yeah, and, and I think the limit's uh, more for free uh, users. Uh, I think if you have the pay version, then... Yeah. But I mean, if you're using the proxy, if you were proxying with something like Trey, I think it'd be hard push to, to hit the limit, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong there. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Uh, the other thing is, that, yeah, it's written in Rust. Um, and you know, I chose Rust at the start and it was out of, I nearly went with Go, but to be honest, I wasn't not a big fan of Go. Um, but I, mean, I am happy that I chose Rust for like the safety and the speed things. I think it potentially um, will give us the ability to create a, a very efficient solution. It's not that efficient at the minute. I have a lot of work to do there. But um, the, the potential, I think, is pretty good. Um, the issue with choosing Rust was web frameworks and stuff. So I have... The, the libraries, especially at the start, weren't a, as strong. It's actually getting there now for a lot of them. But uh, um, I think it's the right choice for like low level uh, common components. And I think you'll see a lot of sort of cloud native infrastructure and possibly being new stuff being written in Rust. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so to install it, I created like a couple of different methods. There's a quick install method, which I can I can demo if you're interested. Um, there's also a standard install methods. The first one I did was with customize, which I really quite like, but everybody wants to use Helm. So I've, I've had to start trying to, to support that properly. Uh, and there is a Helm install now. Uh, but the quick install is quite interesting because normally when you install a registry, you have to faff about setting up a domain name and pointing at it and so on, which is quite right. But, you know, if you have a, just a development cluster, you probably don't have a domain name or you can't be bothered pointing it at a domain name. So I, I the, the quick install has some hacks that kind of gets around that. Yeah, we're happy to see the 
quick install demo. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. It won't take too long. And it might give you a chance to ask any other questions. Uh, right. So let me see if I can get this right. So just before I started this, I did, um, let me find my Zoom window. I did uh, spin up a Kubernetes cluster. I've not even connected to it yet. Uh, let me see if I can share my, I think it's this one. So let me just grab the, the G cloud command. Oh geez, I spun up a bigger cluster than I meant to <laughs> connect. So, so can you see my terminal? Yep, you can see. You're actually using uh, Rust 152, which is a uh, lightly build, not the 150 is the stable release. <laughs> yeah, um, so that actually comes back to like, um, I've been using Rocket, which is a Rust web framework. Um, and it's been pretty good, but I'm, I'm actually in the middle of trying to move off it to, to possibly to Actix because it's a lot faster. Um, but one of the problems with Rocket is that I think they've maybe in the latest versions of Rocket, it's maybe changed, but it was nightly only. So I was, yeah, I had to be on nightly, which was actually a bit frustrating. I would much rather have been on a stable version of Rust. Okay, that's me connected, kubectl. So this this is a completely fresh cluster. I hope it works. There we go. Right, pause. What is it? Dash dash. Uh... Oh whoa! Well. Oh, you get a bunch of stuff. New used to be less there, I think. Okay, apparently it's got stack driver, and I'm sure that's costing me a fortune. <laughs> anyway, so this is a you know that's all. You know, that's only the stuff that comes by, by default. I don't have anything around there at all yet. Um, which directory am I in? So this is a fresh checkout. I, you know, I, I created a new checkout of the repo, new get clone, just so that I, I didn't affect the branch that I was working on. Um, and inside here, there's a quick install directory, which has this install.sh. And if we run that, um, it tells you a little bit about what it's going to do, which is, yeah, create a service account, associate roles for trial, create a Kubernetes service deployment. Um, and the interesting thing is it handles all its TLS certificates and actually uses the Kubernetes CA. Um, and then it will copy that certificate to nodes um, and also to the local laptop. And that's what lets you get around the, you know, not setting up a domain name and using something like a, uh, What's it certificate? I can't remember. You know, there's like a there's a couple of ways you can handle certificates in Kubernetes, um, yeah. but it tends to be annoyingly complex, especially for just developing. Um, yeah, if you run on JKE, you need to run this um, uh, and this. I've done it before, so I don't need to. One of them is just to open the port and the firewall for kubectl, um, and this other one, yeah, what's to do with writes. Um, yeah, so this script is very hacky, but it's kind of cool. Um, you can set the, the namespace you want to install. And for some silly reason, I installed by, to keep public by default. I think that was a mistake. I should probably have created a try namespace. Uh, this step, I should have pushed this a minute ago as well, because this step takes a little while. I've never really figured out why, but for some reason, when you submit a certificate to the Kubernetes CA, it takes a little while before it approves it. Um, Oh yeah, it's already created a bunch of the deployments, the service, role bindings. Yeah, I think this is you know what sometimes we complain about with Kubernetes. You can kind of see it there, just for all I'm really trying to spin up as a single container, but you end up with like a whole bunch of effectively config around about it as well. Okay, there's a certificate. This copy inserts the nodes is, is really a bit of a hack. It, it <laughs> arguably shouldn't be allowed, I think, but you can do it. Uh, and also this bit, when I'm installing a cert on this host and setting up Etsy host so it points to the to the remote cluster. Oops. So where do these certificates live? Do they live in the container or in the pod or 
Oh. Yeah, so the way that, like this hacked version only works with Docker. Like if you have a container D um, based uh, Kubernetes distribution, then, then it's actually going to break. I need to figure out a way to, to make things easy in container D as well. Uh, and it's to do with the, where the certificates live, basically. So what I've done here and all the nodes, I've configured HC hosts um, to know this trial.cube public address. And I've copied the certificate um, to the Docker directory. So in container D, that changes to be a different, it's not even a directory, actually. You've got like set it in the config and it's, it's a bit of a mess, actually. But in Docker, what you can do is you can just put the certificate in a specific Docker directory and Docker sort of picks it up at runtime. So I don't have to restart Docker or anything. But that's not the same with container D, so it's a bit of a problem, to be honest. I think they're actually changing that, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Um, but anyway, so it's 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 copied the certificates to the Docker directory. Um, I can't remember the exact name of it. And um, um, one question here. So the when you modify the Etsy host and the nodes, I guess you have to assume that uh, you need to have a SSH access to those nodes, right? So from the installation. I think it's even worse than that. I can't remember. I had to look exactly what I did. I think I uh, <laughs> creates uh, um, emptied the, uh, I can't remember. It's, <laughs> It's possibly a security pole, actually. I mean, I've not done anything to this Kubernetes cluster. This is like a, a default Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Um, and it's actually surprising what you can achieve. Oh, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but it is. That's what the GKE, right? So. Yeah, yeah, it's a default GKE thing. Um, oh, wish we could remember the details. Basically, yeah, you can edit Etsy host, basically for the node, because mm -hmm. you just mount it, I think. I can't remember the details, but it, it's a while ago since I wrote it, but it stayed, it's kept working for a couple of years now. But it's a hack, it's not, this is purely for setting up a development cluster. It's not something you should ever do in production. Um, oh, okay, okay. Um, so the other bit I've got down here is, um, yeah, we've added it to local laptops. So this is the, just adding it to local laptops to try to keep public. Yeah, can be can be rooted, um, but this bit is a bit more interesting. Um, try with the validation webhook, so that's the admission control I was talking about earlier. Um, so I'm going to say yes. If I said no, then it'll let any image run. But if I say yes, it's only going to allow images from the the try registry to run in this cluster. Oh, and I had to like. Um, I actually, I lie a little bit. I had a special case of Kubernetes images because I didn't do that once and you couldn't update or anything. So that was a, a very bad scene. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think you couldn't even add new nodes. So you have to special case some stuff. Um, okay. So what we can do next, Docker pull. So say we pull an image, we're gonna tag it. I've run this before, so I should be in my history. Right. So I've renamed it to trial.q public port 31,000 slash test, which is, you know, where try was running in this new GKE cluster that's set up to root via my Etsy hosts. And I'm calling it test Nginx Alpine. So I should be able to push that now. Uh, Oops, what have we done? Yeah, I've got two things in there. That was a bit silly. I should have just searched for it in my history. Okay, so that looks like it's pushed. Um, that looks right. Yeah, so we can create a deployment, call it try test, and we're gonna use this image. And that should come up pretty much immediately. Try test. Yeah, so that's up and running already. Um, now, because I put that admission controller on, we should find 
that if I create a deployment, it's got two, oops. And this time we can point it to uh, an image on the Docker Hub. So I can just say Redis. I might come over and say docker.io.redis. Um, and hopefully, so I'm expecting this to be refused because it's not in my registry. Oops. Yeah, so that looks like it has been refused. It's a little bit clunky how you can get the error message because I think it's actually on the um, replica set. So not, not on the deployment per se, right? Yeah, I mean, you will see. Uh, uh, well, we can look at that and, it, and you'll see what I mean. But, so if I go to the replica set, then you get quite a good error message. Mm. You know, error creating a mission web put validate or try to uh, donate the request. Remote image redis is disallowed as it's not in this registry and not in the allow list. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the error message that try was sent to Kubernetes you like when it um, denied the request. Um, but if you look on the deployment, yeah, you get a fail create. That's all you really see. So it's a, yeah, it'd be nice if it was there as well, wouldn't it? But you got to dig into the replicate controller to see the proper error message. So uh, where's uh, so how many replicas of Trout do you have running on a cluster? So you said that it's redundant, right? Or is it, is it a single instance or? No, no, it's, at the minute it's a single instance. There is like when, I, <laughs> it's again, like uh, my ambitions kind of get ahead of me sometimes. So uh, when I designed it, I did design it for the idea of being distributed. So you could have multiple instances for HA and so on. Uh, but I've not really got that far yet. But it, it's, it's actually quite nice all the same because um, it's all based off disk at the minute. So, you know, if you um, pause it or restart it or, you know, just move it, the, the disk somewhere else, then it will all um, just start up and work, which is quite nice. So it is fairly reliable. And you can just put it in like a, a, a volume and attach it and things. Um, yeah, was there any other questions about Trio itself? I've got a couple more slides, but they're not particularly interesting. Is there anything you want to see in a demo, I guess? I can always come back to it as well. I'll leave it open. Yeah, where, where's the trial deployed? And uh, what uh, you, uh, is it in Cube Public? And the, do you yeah, that was. Okay, can we see the login or when it when it's. Oh, yeah. No, why say type in Docker? It's actually been a while since I played with uh, Kubernetes. I'm normally just uh, working in the in VS Code. I, I think it was Cube Public. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. Loop. That's not going to help. That's going to be in the video now. Um, yeah, so that's it there. And these are the, so that was, you were asking about how I copied the certs. It's actually a job that mm -hmm. goes and copies the certs onto each node um, in a slightly hacky way. Uh, so that's those ones you can see completed there. And there's our deploy. How do we get logs again? kubectl. The logs. The pod name. Yeah, then I think I'll need to do n cube public. Um, well, this auto complete. Oh, did. Oh, yeah, that's very. That apparently, this isn't an issue. This. I actually opened a bug about this error message. It's apparently nothing to worry about, but it goes everywhere, which is very annoying. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. So when it starts up, what you see is start and try with the version um, and the port. And yeah, it explains because we turned on the 
admission controller, it makes it explicit, like what's allowed. So we can push anything that's prefixed with Kubernetes at gcr.io. Um, oh, and myself, I think that was another problem I had. Um, <laughs> you, know, you, you need to be able to pull yourself in some cases. Yeah, to update and so on. And you can also say things like, um, this is specific image explicitly allowed. So that would be like a full image name. Or you can say an image with a prefix is allowed. So you could say um, this repository on the Docker Hub is allowed and any image underneath it, if that makes sense. Yeah, where's the, the mission hook? Oh, or you, I mean, because I mean, on the previous example, you specified Redis, right? And it was actually denied here. So, but then when, what makes it so that every deployment can go through that admission controller and, and then basically be prevented from pulling? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty standard Kubernetes stuff. Um, yeah. from, um, KubeCTL. We'll describe work here. So validate an admission. Oops, I hit the wrong button there. I've got a new keyboard. I'm so used to it. Oh, here we go. Oh, no. yeah, there it is. So yeah, you've got this validating webhook configuration. And that should be pointing I have to go and look at the YAML webhooks. Here we go. <laughs> it's got a whole CA bundle. Oh, it actually just looks at so it just looks for the service, I guess, and, and the thing, and then it calls this validate image. Mm. Um, it's actually in port four four three. Um, and if it can't reach it, so that's quite interesting. If you can't reach it, then you fail. Yeah, got it, got it. Cool, cool. Thanks. No, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the interesting things in Kubernetes, I think, because the second people start adding admission controllers, especially mutating ones, then you end up with like very different clusters. So what's something that works in one cluster doesn't necessarily work in another cluster. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to see or will I finish off the slides or? Don't have any more questions here, but uh, I don't know. Any, I, I'm asking all the questions, so I don't know if anybody yeah, else. Is. I like the questions. Um, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll go back to the the slides for the minute. Okay. I can find when my Zoom's gone. Oh, One question I had was regarding um, untagged images. If like, uh, you know, image manifest were to remain, is that something trial would help, you know, purge or is there some policy, you know, um, that uh, administrator could set for that? Um, to be honest, that's not something that I've implemented. Well, actually it is a little bit. There is, so it's actually a little bit strange because in a standard, the distribution standard, there is a delete command. So you can call, you know, from, from like a, sort of rest command line uh you can do an http delete and give it uh, a sha and that will delete the associated blob um now that's obviously quite a low level way of doing things um it's also a bit dangerous because you can delete blobs that are um used by more than one image for example um and for that reason, several registries don't actually support the method of deletion. And I think it's probably going to be changed a bit in, in the standard. I'm not quite sure what, uh, I should go and check exactly what, what the situation with that is at the minute. Um, but it, it arguably makes more sense to uh, do you know, pretty much the same thing that Docker does. So if I say Docker delete uh, an image and I give an image tag, uh, and it will only actually delete the underlying resources if there's no tags that point the two underlying resources if you see what i mean so there's two tags pointing to resource and i delete one of them it doesn't delete that resource until a second tag is deleted um and really i think uh, we should probably do the same thing with docker distribution not docker distribution the distribution standard but i think the reason they wanted to allow things to be deleted by sha 
was say you upload some sensitive content by accident and you want to be able to immediately delete it. I think that was the thinking, um, but it's probably not. I think that was possibly overthinking things rather than uh, an actual good idea, if you see what I mean. But um, I, I really would like to add, um, you know, methods for automatically cleaning st stuff up uh, and deleting old images and so on. Uh, one thing that we're working on at the minute is actually a GUI. Uh, and I think that would be a nice place to surface things like, you know, old images and stuff that could be cleaned up and how much this space you could save or how much you're using at the minute and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then there was something that I saw at an OCI meeting regarding um, registry benchmarking. I don't know if you had come across a, a project like that. Did that happen? I wanted to go to that. That was like only a week or two ago, right? Yeah, it was fairly recent. So I just was wondering if um, I don't. I, I, I just briefly looked over the results, but I didn't know if they had um, saw you know or had done anything with Travis specifically, and was just curious to see the performance there. It's it, well, I'm not sure they have. Um, so at the minute, like I mentioned before, there was. Um, We've been using Rocket, and I'm in the middle of trying to change to a different front end and refactor a few things. So at the minute, Travis is pretty slow, uh, but it's purely because of some arguably bad decisions I took. It's, so it's quite reliable at the minute, but it's slow. Um, but what I'm working on at the minute would, would be like an order of magnitude speed up, or I think it might actually be two orders of magnitude speed up. And in which case, I think Tri will at that point be very competitive. Like I think it should be possible for try to become one of the faster implementations once I've done a few changes. Yeah. At the minute, it won't be though. <laughs> so I'm quite That's happy fair. it wasn't included. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, my, my son's with me here in the background. So apologies for the background noise. But no, thank you. Appreciate the, the insight. No, no worries. Okay, I'll, I think I'll share my couple of last slides and then we can, if there's any more questions or things you want to talk about, that'd be cool. Alina, you saw you on mute for a second, did you? I know, I, I just wanted to say that I had the same situation, he's in the background, so I had to turn off the video and audio. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation, Adrian, it's super cool. No, no worries. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so what's happening in the future? Um, one thing uh, is vulnerability scans, and actually that's one of the things that Harbor has already. But one of the very nice things they did was they basically created a standard. So there's basically a standard in Harbor for how to connect uh, new vulnerability scanners. Um, so if I, the idea is that I'll, I, I can implement pretty much the same interface in Trow, and then you can plug in whatever vulnerability scanner you like assuming it implements that interface. Um, GUI, that's actually been worked on at the minute um, by one of my colleagues, so I'm very keen to get that working and usable. There is a question about whether or not, you know, we should do a GUI that's usable by any sort of uh, OCI compliant registry. At the minute, it's just compatible with Trow, but, you know, it's definitely something to think about. Um, full audit log, yeah, I talked about that earlier. I'm very keen on this idea that, uh, you know, we can look at Trow and see what's happening in Trow, and that gives us um, a very good idea of what's happening in our clusters, or should give us a very good idea of what's happening in our clusters. Mutable tags, um, yeah. So that's actually a really interesting with relation to Kubernetes. You know, when you do like Kubernetes, like the first time you spin up a cluster, you probably thought, right, I want to update this image at some point. And so you just push a new image, and then you're sitting thinking, hang on, how do I, and then you, do, you, know, you did your kubectl deploy, and nothing happened because the YAML hadn't changed because the image name hadn't changed. Um, and that's because Kubernetes effectively sees tags as immutable, right? If you give something a name, it expects that name to only point to this one thing, which isn't the same as Docker, where you can have like the latest tag, which changes over time and so on. Um, but it would be nice to be able to at least support immutable tags in registries. And I think Harbor already has this, but I'm not quite sure they did it because I don't think Docker distribution does. Um, but yeah, it'd be nice to have some support for mutable tags. So like so anything under a given or anything with certain names um, can't be changed once you push something to them. The other thing, and this was really where, <laughs> when I started Try was the main thing I was thinking of and I still not got there, um, but ahead of time image distribution and sort of faster ways to distribute images. 
Um, so, and that goes back to this idea of the work and set. So if I push a new image and I know it's going to be needed in my cluster, um, why don't I send it to the nodes in the cluster before they even do the kubectl deploy and start pulling stuff? Um, and you can do nice things there also using stuff like BitTorrent or um, similar um, algorithms. Oh, I could have presented. Um, and as you're aware, as you're probably aware, there's already a couple of projects, one of which is CNCF, which is the Dragonfly one. Uh, and there's also the Kraken one from Uber for that. Um, they both seem quite large scale projects though. So the, the, they're both around this idea of like distributing images quicker uh, and using sort of BitTorrent style distribution. Um, they do seem quite large projects that intended more at the extremely uh, large scale of clusters. Um, and I would like to try and keep things perhaps a bit simpler, um, if anything. So they're also useful on the, the smaller scale. And I could be wrong there. I might be disparaging Dragonfly, for example, and I don't want to do that because it's certainly an interesting project. So I come backwards. But yeah, that's um, pretty much all I have. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and seeing more questions, I'm interested to hear them. I'm also very interested to hear just your thoughts on Thrive and what you think of the, the direction. Adrian, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question about, uh, about your users. Uh, who, who currently, uh, who's currently using your service? Yeah, that's a good question. There's not a huge amount of users. Um, there is a handful. I think it's, I actually think a lot of people have tried it out and, and played with it in development because it's very quick to uh, spin up. Um, and I think a few people are using it in like CICD. Um, I'm, I've not really got to the bottom of why people need a registry in CICD, but they did. I guess, you know, as many people pushing an image and testing it in a later part of the pipeline. Um, but no, there's not, a, there's not a large number of users. Uh, I and yeah, I'm interested in the thoughts on how I can get more users. I think there's a couple of features that really need to be implemented first, especially around proxy before I can uh, really address the use cases that I've been talking about, if you see what I mean. Thank Good. you. Uh, it's a one more question. question. So, so uh, um, yeah, in more about the, the differentiation with some of the other projects, right? So like, um, I mean, you, you have written Trower and Rust, right? So one of the things is that maybe it's faster, but uh, you know, and so, and then you were saying that maybe because it's in Kubernetes, then uh, it's with a mission controller, it has those capabilities and some of the other registries don't necessarily have that. So are those all the only things that, that you know, where Trow is actually trying to differentiate itself? Uh, um, I'm just thinking because of there, there's, a lot of different projects and I think, uh, you know, all the different projects uh, want to bring some value add, right? And make the users want to use that project, right? So do you have any ideas on what uh, might actually be uh, other differentiation factors for, for trial or? Yeah. Um, yeah, I sort of, I'm slightly scared to repeat myself, but um, yeah. I, I was kind of, so when I started, I was very much, what happened, I had a previous project called Image Rule that was just about, you know, proving you could use like BitTorrent to speed things up. Um, and I used the Docker distribution and basically created a hack that did that. And that was my intention with Try was to do a sort of production version of that. Um, and unfortunately, I never quite, I've not still not quite got as far as I would like with that. Um, and now, of course, we have projects like Dragonfly and um, cracking. Uh, I should really look into those. I think, I guess the main differentiation I see from like harbors, harbors a lot sort of larger, uh, uh, more heavyweight, um, whereas, you know, Thrive intentionally made it lighter. And, you know, I guess that's why people are picking up for things like CICD. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I, I want to look at is sort of security and auditing. I, I think we're missing like stuff there around auditing and, and the supply chain and, and security and so on. Um, it's not clear to me if anybody really shares my concerns though. Uh, certainly people have started talking about supply chains and notary a lot more. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so one question about that. So, I mean, a lot of these other container registries use maybe third-party scanning tools, right? So for container images, right? So um, maybe one way to target different types of users is to have that integrated into mm -hmm. the container registry. Uh, and yeah, and, and then maybe you, you talked about Notary D2, and maybe that could be something that could be used more directly with a container registry to sign or, or verify legitimate images, right? So, yeah, I think that's actually um, potentially quite a big area. Like if we can uh, offer better notary integration, excuse me, or, or support than uh, other registries, I can see that being quite a big thing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm just kind of put in my advice role here a little bit so you know what no, uh, I appreciate that yeah what uh, would be best for for the project I mean to uh, to differentiate itself right so to make people you know want to use it right so do you have any plans to uh, uh, at some point donate this project to the CNCF or some uh, nonprofit or I would certainly be up for that, yeah. Um, at the mo I did consider starting the process, but I think we really need to have a user base before considering that. Yeah, because yeah, we have the sandbox uh, stage and, and that's actually more of a playground, but I'm not really sure if the, I don't remember exactly if there's like a, a requirement for number of users, right? So eventually when, when it goes into like the next stage of incubation, obviously there, there needs to be some amount of users. Mm -hmm. I mean, it but, would probably that be quite a, good. Yeah, but that may be a good place to 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 get traction. I mean, I'm talking about Sandbox, right? But I don't know, you, you have to look at other, what benefits you could get from, from that yourself, to yourself, right? As a, as a project, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I think it might be a good way to like find new users and stuff. So I think it's a good suggestion. It is something I thought about and uh, I perhaps should have been more proactive and done it already. I'm not sure. But yeah, it's, but some of the questions will will uh, be you know about differentiation with other projects. I mean, Harbor is already a CNCF project; it's a graduated mm -hmm. project, right? But and then all, also the question comes up: the, you know, how is this? Uh, yeah, how is this going to be better in the context of like the CNCF? Uh, you know, uh, having all these projects to uh, help uh, end users, right? And and then when you have you know, too many projects that are doing the same thing, it, 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 it may not actually look beneficial for end users because that, that may end up being confusing them, right? So like, well, which one should I use, right? But then the, if there's more distinct features, then there's more of a story right behind like, okay, you can use trial for this type of thing, right? So um, it may actually not not even be about the technology. It may actually it may actually be just about the messaging, right? About yeah, so like how how you position it. Yeah, yeah, that's my thinking as well. Because at the end of the day, of you know, any registry is going to store images, and it's yeah. a pretty basic use case in some ways. It's just about yeah, specializations and yeah, use cases, I guess. Cool. All right, so thank you very much. I think I uh, don't have any more questions. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, do you have any questions for us or anything that uh, you want? No, to... thank you, I answered my questions. Um, so I was, I was looking for some advice and you, you, you gave it. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. So yeah, feel free to reach out. I mean, we're all on Slack or anything. So, so if you need anything, we're we'll happy to help you. Cool. All right. So enjoy the rest of your day and thank you. Thank you. Okay. See you around. See, see you at KubeCon, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been to quite a few. Looking forward to being in person again. Yeah, me too. So I'm waiting for this pandemic to be over. So. <laughs> okay. Cheers then. Bye. Bye.